Well, if you saw the video I saw of Kamala Harris, for copyright reasons I'm not able to show it, you'd realize why the Democrats have stuck with Joe Biden. Even though he last night in the Hamptons, where else would he be? On stage with somebody I've never heard of, Jimmy somebody, and somebody I have heard of, President Barack Obama. They were taking a bow in front of an elevator sound rock band, uh, and Joe just froze. He literally could not move. Not a muscle, not a Botoxed eyebrow. He had to be led off the stage like an embarrassing elder, an embarrassing senior, which is, of course, exactly what he is. Obama made no pretense about the power relationship between the two. It's well worth watching if you get the opportunity. Welcome to all those who are following the show on radio KPFK and to our worldwide audience who are uninterested in the kickoff between England and Serbia in the European Championships at 8 o'clock. At least watch the first hour of the show. Or tape record, as we used to say, the football and watch it later. Our numbers dived over the last uh, couple of days because of this infernal European Championships. I hope people play catch up with the mother of all talk shows thereafter. The Kamala Harris saga is really something you need to focus on now. It is a commonplace that President Joe Biden has lost his marbles. It's not all he's losing in public, in his pants, on the most auspicious public occasions but he's definitely lost his marbles. He's increasingly feeble, increasing, increasingly frozen uh, in front of the arc lights, not so much like a rabbit caught in the headlights, but he is increasingly, embarrassingly out of touch. He does not know where he is or which buttons he's pushing. And that's important if you watch the communique of the G7 and the communique of the Swiss role, the so-called Swiss peace conference over Ukraine and NATO uh, against Russia, where actually some of the most extraordinary statements have been made, one by the foreign minister of Saudi Arabia, that no credible gathering such as this can take place without the presence of Russia. Rishi Sunak denounced Russia for not coming to the peace conference, forgetting that Russia was specifically not invited to the peace conference. But the highlight that caught my eye was Prime Minister Meloni. And I warned you, I warned you in the last show about Le Pen. I warned you about the AFD. They're culture warriors. They're not real warriors. They have no intention of challenging the international status quo. And Maloney is the case in point. She actually said that if Russia does not accept the terms of the Swiss role, we will have to force them to surrender. The Italian armed forces, of course, are mighty and with a great war record. That their tanks have five gears, four of them reverse gears, and one forward gear in case they're attacked from behind is only folklore. And Maloney is a great war leader. You can take a look at her there on the screen. The Russians must be quaking in their boots. I can't wait to hear Medvedev's reply. Putin is too statesmanlike to stoop to her level. But these seven dwarves in the G7 have such a conceit of themselves. They don't seem to understand that any group which includes Canada as one of the top seven economies in the world and excludes China, the biggest economy in the world, excludes Russia, excludes India. These people are living in a history book. They're living in a history book which is a talking history book, but which continues its talking points set in the 20th century and 
pretty early in the 20th century. The world that has moved on and now exists, the material reality that now exists, means this braggadocio, is that an Italian word? From signora, is that how you say it? Meloni, just looks unhinged. Who is Italy to say they will force Russia to surrender? And of course, surrender they will not. They were, though, it is now proven, close to reaching a negotiated settlement with Ukraine hundreds of thousands of lives ago, hundreds of billions of dollars ago, hundreds of thousands of square miles of liberated territory ago. They had virtually resolved their differences in the talks in Istanbul, in which my colleague, the Honorable Craig Murray, standing for the Workers' Party in Blackburn, was actually in the room. He was there as a consultant to Erdogan's government in Istanbul. He's told me how close they were to reaching an agreement between Russia and Ukraine based on Ukraine's absolute neutrality, based on Ukraine eschewing the possibility forever of joining Joe Biden's nuclear armed war machine, otherwise known as NATO. And when the document returned to Kiev, having been initialed, penciled, to be inked, the loathsome reptilian rhinoceros Boris Johnson flew presumably on American orders all the way to Kiev to instruct little Zelensky, the cokehead, that he could not sign that agreement. And hundreds of thousands of people have lost their lives. Hundreds of billions of dollars of your taxes has been burned. And as I say, hundreds of thousands of square miles of Ukrainian territory is no longer even likely, even possibly, the subject of negotiation. These territories are gone forever. They will be part of Novorossiya, the new Russia, forever. And all those lives ain't coming back. And every day we see new gruesome footage of men being hunted down by Zelensky's recruiting sergeants and dragged off screaming and kicking to the front with only the most rudimentary training and arming. They are being led like lambs to the slaughter. And Joe Biden just whispers in their ear, there's another 60 billion coming your way. Donald Trump said today that Zelensky is the greatest salesman in history. Every time he comes to the United States, he leaves with $60 billion. And as soon as he gets home, he asks for another $60 billion. Now, of course, a lot of this is just uh, payola. A lot of this is just pork barling. They're not really sending all $60 billion to Zelensky. They're handing it to their own military industrial complex to make more profits from the American taxpayer and kick back some of those profits to the American politicians that voted for the money in the first place. Nice work if you can get it. It is corruption on a grand scale. It is grand larceny of the public purse. But enough goes to Zelensky to keep him in coke and allow him to buy an ever-expanding portfolio of a beachfront properties in some of the most attractive locations in the world. The loser is you, but the biggest loser is the ordinary public of Ukraine. As a very prominent Ukrainian journalist said today, the best way to end the war in one hour is to open Ukraine's borders, its western borders. Because if you do that, Within one hour, all the men in Ukraine will leave the country. They don't want to die for Zelensky. They're far too well educated 
and civilized a people to want to do that. Speaking of sacrifice, let me turn to the Eid, which was celebrated by billions of Muslims today and tomorrow. There's two Eids. And the Eid that was celebrated today and tomorrow was the Eid al-Adha, which means sacrifice, commemorating the uh, Abrahamic uh, principle of the slaughtering of sacrificial animals. But the people being sacrificed in Palestine are not animals. They are women and children in unprecedented numbers. You probably thought there was a ceasefire or at least one in the pipeline. You probably thought there was at least a ceasefire in the post. You probably thought that the Security Council resolution just last week passed without opposition for a change was the beginning of the end, but it's only the end of the beginning. It's only the end of the beginning of the chapter of Palestinian disaster, which began on October the 7th and 8th. It's not, of course, the beginning for the Palestinians because they've been suffering for over a hundred years from the Balfour Declaration, which was signed in Cheatham Hill, in Manchester, in a building in which I spoke last night. That's right. I spoke last night in the building in Cheatham Hill in Manchester, where the Balfour Declaration was signed. And very nearby is the street, and I saw the house in which the founding Prime Minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, used to live. He lived there, operated there. And Balfour himself had a constituency in Withenshaw in Manchester, just one mile away from Ben-Gurion Street. And so Manchester, never mind Britain, Manchester is at the center of the entire catastrophe that has struck down Palestinians stolen their lands and allowed them to be ruthlessly repressed and scattered across the world, a little area of Manchester is at the center of it. And what do you know? There are seven Labour members of Parliament in Manchester who are members of the Labour Friends of Israel. Now, what first attracted these seven dwarves uh, to a country thousands of miles away of only then seven million citizens on the shores of the Mediterranean. Why weren't they friends of, I don't know, um, Zimbabwe or friends of Thailand? What first attracted them to this so-called state of Israel? I'll tell you what. First of all, opportunism, because they already knew that the way to get on in the British Labour Party is to be a friend of Israel. But secondly, they realized there were many rewards to be reaped by being a friend of Israel rather than a friend of Zimbabwe. First of all, you'll be able to raise lots of money. And a third of the members of the Labour front bench are funded by the Israel lobby. Secondly, you will be guaranteed the fairest of winds in the British media, print and broadcasting if you are a friend of Israel. I could say thirdly, that you will never be allowed to be a minister in the foreign office with a responsibility for the Middle East unless you are a member of the Labour Friends of Israel. Prove me wrong on that. These benefits, friends with benefits, is what they are. The benefits accrue to them. Now, they're small beer compared to the American experience, where people who are not even legends in their own congressional districts pick up not just six-figure sums, from the APAC and associated 
lobby fundraising activities, but many of them, including people even I have never heard of, and I'm a political junkie, seven-figure sums. In the case of Joe Biden, 11.4 million donations from the Israel lobby. But back to Manchester and the seven dwarfs, the Labour MPs who are members of the Labour Friends of Israel. We know what first attracted them, but what continued to attract them, such that in the middle of a genocide and facing a general election, not one of them has resigned in protest at Netanyahu's mass murder of Palestinian women and children, even today on the Eid. These hypocrites are putting out tweets wishing Muslims Eid Mubarak while supporting an Israel that is massacring Palestinian children on the very day that they issued those tweets. And they think the people are fools. They think that the Muslims in Britain are going to return them to office anyway. Well, all the polling data now in front of us indicates that actually the number of people voting for the two main parties in Britain, the Conservatives and Labour, is going to be the lowest number since the Second World War. In the first general election, in which I was a fully conscious participant, 1970, in the hot summer of 1970, when Labour's Harold Wilson lost to the Conservatives' Ted Heath, 88.8% of the people of Britain voted either Conservative or Labour. That figure will now be well below 50%. The pollsters say it's because of the rise of smaller parties and independents. And so it is. And I happen to have the great privilege to be the leader of one of those smaller parties. Although last night in Manchester, as 20 of our Manchester candidates lined up on a table, not long enough, no matter how many tables they added, couldn't get all our candidates at it. Some had to sit in the extraordinarily packed, huge crowd who crammed into the building, that building that was once a house of such ill repute that the Palestinian disaster was authored within it. But I've only got time to talk about what's happening in Palestine today. The truth is, there's no ceasefire. And even if there was a pause in the ceasefire, the fire would quickly resume, just as soon as the Israeli hostages were released. Netanyahu would continue the war, continue the war in the north, continue the war in Gaza, continue the war in Jerusalem, continue the war in the West Bank. Because a, 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 a scorpion stings because it's a scorpion. The massacres, the endless war, is because that's what Israel is, born in terrorist atrocity against us as well as against the Palestinian majority that lived there then. It, the, the scorpion stings because it can't help itself. Netanyahu murders because he can't help himself. With the side note that if he stops murdering, his own people will bring him down and he'll have to face general elections, which may very well end with him having to actually serve the prison sentence, which he richly deserves. Right at this moment, there are hundreds of thousands of people on the streets of Tel Aviv. They're not peaceniks. They're not people who want to provide justice for the Palestinians, but they sure as hell want Netanyahu out, and only a fool would be on the other side of that argument. We've got Arab Barghouti, the son of Palestine's Nelson Mandela, 
Marwan Barghouti, behind bars, yes, but in the hearts of every Palestinian, he is the real leader. Arab Barghouti coming up right now. Stay tuned.